the title of this morning's message is Holy Separation. Holy Separation. Now, if you were studying Hebrew, the interesting thing about this title, Holy Separation, is actually the word holy means to be separate. So it's almost like saying separation, separation, because it's the same word. In Hebrew, this word is kodesh, and it means apartness, holiness, sacredness, and literally separateness. So we talk about being holy when God says, be ye holy as I am holy. He is literally saying being separate, but separate from what? What exactly is he talking about? Now, I know immediately we would all go to the fact of, you know, we wouldn't want to be mixed in immorality, but is he talking about separating ourselves from certain people? And I would say that if you would study scripture, that you would conclusively come up with the answer, yes. That there is a time biblically to separate from someone else. Biblically, so that's what we're asking, and we're going to answer with Scripture. Now, this I have to preface this by saying, my, the tech team, when they received my notes last week, I got sick. I was supposed to p- preach this last week, and we swapped weeks. When they got my notes, this is the most notes I've ever turned in for any message. I think they had 116 slides they put in the computer, <laughs> computer um, this week. So I'm not going to keep you forever. I put it all in there. A lot of it is scripture because I want to prove this just with scripture. But we're going to ask the question, biblically, is there ever a time when we're instructed to separate ourselves from someone else? And if so... If there ever is a time when we're supposed to separate ourselves from someone, how do we do it, when do we do it, and why do we do it? And so I want to answer these questions through Scripture because you don't need my opinion. You don't need man's opinion or a theologian's opinion. You need the Scripture's opinion. Can I get an amen? And if God is asking us to do something, then we need to be poised to obey. Now, this is such a tender topic. There is a reason in the eight-year history of our church we have never devoted an entire message to separating yourself from other people, and it's because often this topic is used to justify a spiritual elitism or Phariseeism. It's used to justify unforgiveness, and so I'm going to say this. If you're just wanting to get out of a relationship because you're embittered, this is not the message for you. Because as you will see, that this message really has nothing to do with separating from people that you like or that you want to be around. Actually, usually it's opposite. It's people that are damaging your personal walk, but you actually like them and you love them. Okay, now you got really quiet. But there's a reason I think even the timing of this message had to come after we spent five weeks studying forgiveness. Because you have to approach this topic with love. And so before we start to answer the question, who do we separate from? And is there a time to separate? Before we address who we should separate from, we have to first establish who we should be connected to. Because really, this is the preeminent question. When I say, be ye separate or holy, holy unto who? The Lord. Come on. Holy unto who? The Lord. Separate for the Lord's purposes. And so the important thing, the underlying thing I need you to hear me on this morning is the better question to ask is who am I attached to the most and how vehemently will I stay attached to him? Because in scripture, Jesus said this in Matthew 22, Someone asked him, teacher, what's the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with some of your heart, some of your soul, and some of your mind. Is that what this says? You must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind. This is the greatest commandment. See, I think sometimes we imagine our love like a pie, right? And we're going to give God the biggest piece because he's first, and then we'll give everybody else what's left over. And sorry, I don't have anything left over for you, Facebook friend, okay? Right? This is how we imagine this. It's a piece of pie. But that's not actually what scripture says. Scripture says that God gets all of our love. Every bit of our love is reserved. Every bit of our heart is reserved for God. And because he is love, the definition of God is love, that through God, now I can spill over and love those around me. I'm not trying to conjure up love for someone who is mean to me. I can't do that because I'm limited in my human faculties. But if I love the Lord God and I am hitched to him, 
I am so hitched to him. He has all of my heart, all of my mind, all of my soul that I'm now loving people through him. Do you hear me? So the important thing to ask is if I am a Christian, if I have bowed and given leadership, lordship of my heart to Jesus Christ, then I have given him the whole pie. And so I cannot unhitch from him to go to someone else. If someone else is threatening or asking me to leave and unhitch him and to compromise, I have to be willing to let them separate from me. Because I will not take a piece of my heart and give to you what I've already given to God. And this is not unreasonable. When a bride marries the groom, we don't tell her, now listen, just make sure that you give the groom the biggest piece of yourself. Make sure if you're going to go on dates, the best dates are reserved for your husband. Do we, do we t- say this in marriage? Absolutely not. We say, now listen, you are in covenant with him, forsaking what? All others. Let no, what God has joined together, what? Let no person put room in between or separate. You are now connected, and anything who threatens that, anything that comes against that, you need to run from it because you're in covenant with it. So you're loving with all. And then we go on to find in Proverbs, remember, this is the greatest commandment. Jesus said this is the greatest commandment, that we love God. It means we can't love our neighbor as we love ourselves if we don't first hitch ourselves to the source of unlimited love, which is God himself. So we have to remain hitched to him first. But then we also hear this huge imperative in Proverbs 4, 23. Above everything else, guard your heart, for it is the source of life's consequences. Your primary responsibility The one thing you can control in this chaotic and insane world is your own heart. And everything in your life is going to flow from this beating vessel in your heart. You have to guard it. That if I'm going to love God with my whole heart, I've got to be aware of anything that would threaten this relationship. Because I'm going to tell you, the enemy is going to try to threaten and to woo you away from your first love. And you know he, who is the most sneaky, most crafty threat are people that you like. Of course, he's not going to woo you away with someone who is mean to you. He is going to woo you away with someone who will coddle you, who will love you, who will side with you. And so we're going to look at what the scripture say Who now does the Bible command us to separate from? Now, I am going to put a disclaimer. When I say this, I'm not giving you permission to divorce your husband or your wife. I'm not talking about relationship covenants that you have obligation to. Even your parents, you have obligation to care for your elderly parents, okay? Does it mean if if there's a toxic relationship, you can take care of them and you don't have to spend all your time there, but you have some obligations via scripture, okay? Children, this does not mean emancipate from your parents and you're 15 because of this, okay? So I'm not talking about biblical relationships. And what I'm not also giving you license to is to be yoked to an unbeliever, Scripture says that believers don't have fellowship with darkness. So when we talk about entering covenant relationships like marriage or business partnerships, Scripture teaches us they should be Christians, okay? So I'm putting this disclaimer out. But there are two cases, not just in the New Testament, but all throughout Scripture. And this is why I had so many notes. It's because I put so much Scripture in here. And once I show this to you, and once you see it, if you're having quiet time, I am going to wager everything that you will not be able to unsee this. It's going to be all, you're going to see how much this is in scripture. There are two clear cases where God says, get away from them. Are you ready? If you're ready, say, I'm ready. Now, all of that to say, the first verse that I'm about to read, I, about three years ago, posted on Facebook just this scripture. I had no, re- I wasn't thinking about anybody when I posted it. It just struck me. And so I posted this scripture. No commentary, just the scripture. It was about 30 minutes later, I got a private message from a girl who I really hadn't seen or talked to in about six to eight months. I don't think she had been coming to church. But honestly, she wasn't that faithful. I didn't, we weren't, we didn't talk all the time. So I was not thinking about her when I posted this. And I got a long message. How dare you? I know you're talking about me. And I'm like, whoa. I said, sweetheart you realize that all I posted was scripture. 
I didn't put commentary. I wasn't thinking about you when I put this. I was sharing scripture with people. I was like, maybe the, you're not offended with me, but you're offended with the word. And so, and she backed down and she recognized. So I, what I want you to say, all of that to say, if these scriptures rub you the wrong way, it's because scripture calls itself a sword. And it cuts. But I didn't write this, so don't send me a Facebook message. I am going to read you a series of scriptures, and I am going to refrain from commentary. And I'm just going to ask you to let the scripture speak for itself. Are you ready? 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 13. When I wrote to you before, this is Paul. I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. But I was not talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin, who are greedy, who cheat people, who worship idols. You would have to leave this world to avoid people like that. I meant that you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer yet indulges in sexual sin or is greedy, worships idols, abusive, a drunkard, or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people. It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it is certainly your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside, but as scriptures say, you must remove the evil person from among you. I did not write this. This is the spirit of God through the apostle Paul. He's not talking about the lost. Jesus was a friend of sinners. He ate with tax collectors and prostitutes. He is not talking about the lost. Could I clarify this one more time? Jesus is not talking about the lost. The lost need us in their lives. He is talking about people who claim to be Christian but live immoral lives. So the first type of person is the immoral Christian. And I'm going to do air quotes. Christian. This is not lost people. In Jude chapter 1 verse 3 but now I find that I must write to you about something else, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once and for all time to his holy people. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there is a tolerance that Jesus won't tolerate. Revelation 2.14 says this. This is Jesus talking to one of the churches. And he says, but I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and committing sexual sin. Revelation 2.20, nevertheless, I have this against you, a different church. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and eating food sacrificed to idols. Now, let me clarify what I am not saying is that someone who's in the church who has slipped and fallen into sexual sin or immorality. I'm not saying that. I'm talking about willful, deliberate, continual immorality. Making excuses for willful, deliberate, continual. I'm not talking about a season where maybe you're, you're battling pornography and trying to get help. I'm not talking about that. I'm not even talking about you are in an affair right now, but God wants to deliver you and rescue you out of it. I'm not talking about repentant sin. I'm talking about willful, deliberate, excuse, using the grace of God as an excuse to sin. And to show you how serious I am about this, and I had her permission to share this anonymously, but a few years back, I got a letter after conference from someone who was going through a hard time battling depression and anxiety. She had a low point in her life, and she came here regularly, was serving in the church. She got drunk. She went to a bar, got drunk. She had a one-night stand with someone and ended up pregnant and then had an, had an abortion. She wrote the letter to me and confessed it broken and repentant. I never told a soul. I restored her, and she is serving in this church today, forgiven, healed, and delivered. Amen? There is no sin that God can't redeem. So what I am not saying is that 
Someone who is trying and falling, that's who we commit. But this is saying someone who is teaching people to live immorally because they're claiming to be a Christian, but they keep living in this depravity. Separate yourself. Don't even eat with them, the scripture said. But here's the bigger one, because honestly, I think the immoral person is really a symptom of the second one. The second type is actually more spoken of in scripture to separate from than even the first type. And I see it as a weightier issue because it can lead to other issues. Are you ready for this one? The second person to divide from is the divisive person. Now, this doesn't have to necessarily be a Christian. This is anyone who is divisive in nature. Titus, you ready for scripture? I'm just going to come at you with them. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. Titus 3, 9 through 11, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once, then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing more to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful and they are self-condemned. Warn them once, warn them twice, then don't talk to them again. Romans 16, 17, and now I make one more appeal, my dear brothers and sisters. Watch out for people who cause divisions and upset people's faith by teaching things contrary to what you have been taught. Stay away from them. Proverbs 22, 10, throw out the mocker and fighting goes too. Quarrels and insults will disappear. 1 Corinthians 1, 10, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with one another. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Psalm 101, 5, I will not tolerate people who slander their neighbors. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, amplified version. These six things, this is the six deadly, there are seven deadly sins, the seven sins that God hates. These six things the Lord hates, indeed seven are repulsive to him. A proud look, an attitude that makes one overestimate oneself and discount others. A lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that creates wicked plans, feet that run swiftly to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, even half-truths, and one who spreads discord or rumors among brothers. Did you know that a gossiper is among the seven sins that God hates? Right there with hands that murder innocent blood. Proverbs 20, 19, he who goes about as a gossip reveals secrets, therefore do not associate with a gossip, one who talks freely or flatters. First, First Timothy 6, 3 through 5, some people may contradict our teaching, but these are the wholesome teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. These teachings promote a godly life. Anyone who teaches something different is arrogant and lacks understanding. Such a person has an unhealthy desire to quibble over the meaning of words. Ever met anyone like that? Can I get an, oh yeah. This stirs up arguments, ending in jealousy, division, slander, and evil suspicions. These people always cause trouble. Their minds are corrupt, and they have turned their backs on the truth. Titus 3, 9 through 11, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable. They are worthless. Reject a factitious man after a first and second warning, knowing that a man is perverted, listen to this, and is sinning being self-condemned. Now, why do I say that the divisive person is the more dangerous person? And it's more dangerous to be a divisive, slanderous person than even an immoral person. Remember what Jesus said, that we have to first get the plank out of our own eye before we can help to see? When we operate in a place of judgmentalism and pride, and, oh, I gotta help everybody, oh, that church, that pastor, this is why you don't see us calling out pastors. That's not my job. I don't, you know what? Jesus is clear that It's his job to judge his church, not ours. And God forbid that I cross a line and I start pointing a finger at someone who's called the beloved daughter or son of the king. I don't want to be on the wrong side of God when I have assumed that it's my job to begin to point out errors in everyone else. And so what happens is we assume a position of pride or judgmentalism. We're trying to get the the speck out of everyone else's eye. We don't see the enemy coming through our own back door because we're too busy worried about everyone else. So in my estimation, and I know that in the book Humility by R.T. Kendall, fascinating book, beautiful book, he says the same thing. Where there is a judgmental person, watch for it, wait for it, there is immorality going on. There is sexual sin, there is gross immorality going on in the judgmental Pharisee person. Why? Because when I'm trying to get the speck out of theirs, I don't even see the log in mine. I'm so busy worried about everybody else that I'm not noticing the assault that's coming to my own heart through the back door. 
In 2 Timothy 2, 14 through 16, it says, remind everyone about these things and command them in God's presence to stop fighting over words. So listen, I have a direct command. Do you hear me? This is scripture. Command them in God's presence, stop fighting over words. Stop fighting over words. This is the word of the Lord. Stop fighting over words. Such arguments are useless. They can ruin those who hear them. Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker. It's talking about worrying about your own heart. One who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of God. Avoid worthless, foolish talk. Why? Because it only leads to more godless behavior. Now, I want to stick a little thumb, a little side note in this. We're going to talk about how do we separate from them and when. But before I do, I want you to understand that in our day and age, in our culture, this is not necessarily just talking about people, but things that cause division and immorality. Namely, media that causes division and immorality. I read a a story, a little meme, and it said, you know, if you go to the Southwest and you find the red fire ants and the black fire ants and you stick them in a jar, they'll be just fine. But then if you shake the jar and dump them out on the ground, they'll all start to kill each other. And they never stop to ask, who shook the jar? Can I ask you, who is shaking the jar and why? And let me give you a hint. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and rulers of darkness. There is a force that desires to take our nation down, and it's not human. It's supernatural force that is shaking the jar and using the divisive thing called media and social media that have tainted and polarized us until we are destroying ourselves. Will you listen? We are at a pivotal moment in history for this nation because a nation divided against itself cannot stand and a church divided against itself cannot stand. And we have to ask ourselves if we are being responsible with what we are posting and spreading. If we are causing peace to be made and being a peacemaker, or if we are causing more extreme polarizations to happen. Can I tell you that change never comes from a post. It comes from a conversation in love with someone you are in covenant with. This is how we work through disagreement. Not by shouting and screaming rhetoric that was handed to us by the enemy. He is fueling this. He is shaking the jar and we are consuming one another. And the bad thing is it's not just happening outside in the nation. It's happening in the church. I have never seen the church more divided than now. And it stems through politics. Warn a divisive person once. Then warn them again and then have nothing more to do with them. Why? Because they will unhitch you from the love of God. If they are threatening this, then get away from them. Do you want me to tell you something? I am going to love you and be your friend even if I I disagree with you. And we can have a civil, loving conversation. And we're still going to be buddies. And I want to hear you. And I want you to be heard. And I'm going to ask you to hear me and let me be heard. And this is how conflict is resolved like human beings, not like toddlers. Someone is shaking the jar, and it's affected the church. And God is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. And there is, we are on the cusp. Don't tell me we're not in the end times and the world's not groaning. The Bible talks about a great falling away that will happen, and I'm convinced we're starting to see that. When everything that can be shaken will be shaken. So what you're holding on to better be the word and not some man's ideas. It's the only thing that's going to last. Warn a divisive person once. Warn them again. Then have nothing more to do with them. So now why does the command Why does the Bible command us to separate? Why is it so imperative? First, I'm going to have to go through these fast, y'all, because we can become corrupted by their sin. Proverbs 22, 24 through 25 says this, don't befriend angry people or associate with hot-tempered people, or you will learn to be like them and endanger your soul. If you have someone in your life that every time you leave, you're mad at other people, it's time to warn them. It's time to make some different choices. 
Because the fruit of the Spirit, ask yourself this, when I get around this person, do I, I feel the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control, are they connected to God in this way? Or do I feel jealousy, outburst of anger, rage, is this what I feel when I'm around them? Because these are the works of the flesh, and this is the work of the Spirit. And I don't know about you, but the people I'm in close covenant with, I want them to stir me toward Christ, not pull me away from them. And so we have to look at this. It says, don't befriend them, because 1 Corinthians 15, says, bad company corrupts good character. You know, when I am trying to eat healthy and doing my best to not eat at night, eating at night. Anybody else, like, that's your time. You'll do good all day. And then at night, you just, like, consume, like, five days worth of calories in 30 minutes. And you don't, like, what did I just do? Don't look at me. I'm ashamed, you know. <laughs> okay, so when I'm doing, doing well with my diet, if, I, if Brandon's not doing well at that particular time, there was a season he eats better than I do now, but there was a particular time when he would just eat, like, pizza and chips and Doritos at 10 o'clock at night. And so, you know what? I would do well for a period of time, but if I have a bad day and chocolate is around and someone else is eating chocolate, guess what I'm going to do on my bad day? I'm going to eat chocolate, right? And, you know, we can go through five weeks about unforgiveness, but if you still got people in your life that are toxic and you have a bad day, you're going to keep that door for unforgiveness is going to stay open because you left it open. There comes a point in time you have to cut off that. You have to eliminate tomorrow's temptation today and realize this person is why I keep struggling with this area because they're struggling. And so don't go calling them right now and saying it's over. You and me are done. Like that's not how this, this works. Proverbs 26, 20 says, for a lack of wood, the fire goes out, and where there's no whisper who gossips, contention quiets down. This is why I don't ever get super upset if we have, just listen to me, hear me out. I'm not saying this, well, maybe, it's, maybe I don't have the right heart, but I'm just saying. When someone leaves the church that is a factitious, divisive person, I ain't sad about it. Okay, I'm sad for them, but honestly, there's a sense of relief because suddenly there's peace again. Where there is no whisper who gossips, contention quiets down. Like charcoal to hot embers and wood to a fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. Kindling it, kindling it, kindling it. You're trying to let it go, and they keep kindling it. The words of a whisper or gossip are like dainty mortals, morsels greedily eaten. Okay? So this is like chocolate, greedily eaten. They go down the innermost chambers of the body to be remembered and mused upon. That means when that person says something and it seems like it's coddling and it seems so, you're right. Who are they to do that? You're right. And you take that and it feels good. You feel justified and it goes down deep and you're going to bring it back up again. They've left the room, but man, their gossip has stayed with you. And their seed has been planted in your heart. They go down to the innermost chambers of the body to be remembered and used upon like a common clay vessel covered up with silver dross, making it appear silver when it really has no value, are burning lips, murmuring, manipulative words, and a wicked heart. He who hates disguises it with his lips, but stores up deceit in his heart when he speaks graciously and kindly to conceal his malice. Do not trust him. For seven abominations are in his heart. Do not trust him. This brings us to the second thing. Why does the Bible command us to separate? We'll become wounded by their toxicity. If you think for a moment that you're getting around someone who likes, has loose lips, likes to spill the tea about everybody else, if you think for one moment that when you walk out that door and you close it and you get into the car, they are not doing the same thing to you, it is in their heart. They can't not do it. And so if they are talking about someone who is talking, is eager to talk about everybody else around you, is also wounding you behind your back. And you're going to be wounded by it. In 1 Samuel 20, it says this. This is talking about David and Saul. And I got I to, gotta, before you put this up on the screen, this is a PG-13 verse, okay? Um, it's a straight scripture, but it's PG-13. Now, Saul hated David. Saul was king. David was threatening that. Saul was jealous of David. And so Saul tries to kill and murder David. And he's throwing spears at him and all kinds of crazy stuff. And David has to flee. David tries to reconcile, tries to reconcile. It becomes clear that Saul is really just eaten up with this bitterness and this offense. And so David finally, his only course of action is to run away. And he goes and hides in caves away from this angry Saul. But the problem was that Saul's son was David's best friend, Jonathan. 
And they were in covenant relationship together. They were best friends. And so Jonathan is David, Jonathan is Saul's son. He's second in command. And he stays in the kingdom and he tries to help David a little bit, but he stays next to Saul. And I want you to hear what happens to Jonathan now. This is Saul's own son. Saul boiled with rage at Jonathan. You stupid son of a whore, he swore at him. Do you think I don't know you want him to be king in your place, shaming yourself and your mother? As long as that son of Jesse is alive, you'll never be king. Now go go and get him so I can kill him. But why should he be put to death? Jonathan asked his father. What has he done? Then Saul hurled his spear at Jonathan, intending to kill him. So at last, Jonathan realized that his father was really determined to kill David. The sad part of this story is that Jonathan ends up dying for Saul's sin. Jonathan ends up killed in battle along with his father. Now I have to ask myself, why didn't Jonathan leave and go with David after, he was, after there was an attempt on his life? What do you think the answer is? Because it was his dad. Because it was a close relationship with him. But you have to ask yourself this. If Jonathan would have left his dad and gone with David, his life would have been spared, and I can guarantee you he would have been second in command of the kingdom. Things would have turned out different, but he wasn't willing to do it because the relationship was so close. And this is where we bring this very difficult scripture to light in Matthew 10. It's used many times out of context. This is Jesus. Do not suppose I have come to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn man against father, daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or more more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. What is he talking about? This word hate in the Greek is a comparative word. What Jesus is saying is you have to be so, when you come after me, you have to be so hitched to me that when you compare a side-by-side of your love for me and your love for your own child, it almost looks like hate. There's such a big difference. That your love for me, comparatively, for, you, for me, is so much greater than even your love for your mama, that it would look like hate. And that if there ever came a time when your own mother or your own child was forcing or trying to hit, unhitch you from me, you were willing to let a sword divide you. You're willing to walk away from the closest relationship or to distance yourself from the closest relationship if they are threatening the most vital relationship, you and Yahweh. He is calling for complete and total allegiance of your heart. This is why I'm saying he's not wanting a peace. He's wanting it all. He wants all of your love, all of your heart, all of your devotion. And the third, way, third reason why we have to separate is because we could become consumed with what's swallowing them. Number 16, now hang on with me there, because I know all of you are asking all kinds of questions, okay, and we're going to hopefully get to that, of how and why and what do we do logistically. Number 16, 19, meanwhile, Korah had stirred up, this is Moses and the children of Israel, they're wandering in the wilderness, everybody's, they've got a coup going on from from Korah, and it says this, Korah had stirred up the entire community against Moses and Aaron. They all gathered at the tabernacle entrance, and the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to the whole community. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, get away from all these people so that I could instantly destroy them. Verse 22, and the Lord said to Moses, then all the people, then tell all the people to get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. So Moses got up and rushed over to the tents of Dathan and Abiram, followed by the elders of leader the, of Israel. Quick, he told the people, get away from the tents of these wicked men and don't touch anything that belongs to them. If you do, you will be destroyed for their sins. Verse 31, he had hardly finished speaking the words when the ground suddenly split open beneath them. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed the men along with their households, their followers, and those who were standing with them and everything they owned. So they went down alive into the grave along with their belongings. The earth closed over them and they vanished from among the people of Israel. Now what does this mean? We are from the dust from the earth. And this is significant of our earthly Adamic nature, this fleshly nature swallowing us alive. When we get next to this judgmental, pointing the finger, proud heart, that we are poised to be swallowed by our own earthly nature. And if we stay close to anybody with that mindset, we will be swallowed by their own sinfulness. I'm not talking about lost folk. I'm talking about people who bear the name of Christ, 
but are willfully, repeatedly following these kinds of patterns of behavior. And just to reassure you, if you've gossiped in the church, welcome to humanity, okay? Every one of us, myself included, have places to to grow in this area. But again, I'm not talking about repentance. I'm talking about, this is why I said warn them once, warn them twice. 1 Corinthians 5, 5 through 7 says this, this is Paul, you must throw this man out and hand him over to Satan so that his sinful nature will be destroyed and he himself will be saved on the day the Lord returns. Your boasting about this is terrible. Don't you realize this sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast by removing this wicked person from among you. Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Now again, Christ is coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. Anything that is like yeast of sin that has permeated its way in the church, this is the time. God, I believe God wants to use what's happening globally on the earth to purify his bride. And this is why it was so critical we address this. Because I believe we cannot move forward as long as we have left open doors to people that are systematically dismantling the kingdom of God. We are not wrestling against flesh and blood. It's not the person. It is a spirit behind the person. So let's talk about, before we talk about how we do that, let's talk about when we do it. When does the Bible command us to separate? Number one, after prayer and searching our own heart. Matthew 7, 4 through 5 says, how can you say to a brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in yours, you hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. It's not that you can't help them, it's that first you have to address you. Then you will see clearly when you've addressed your own issues. So I'm going to ask you to ask yourself a hard question. If people are coming to you with slander and gossip, why are they so comfortable with gossiping around me? Especially if you are hearing it from multiple sources, why are we so comfortable? We have to first address, have I participated in this? Have I enabled this? Have I provided an eager listening ear to this that I need to go and make my own repentance for? I need to deal with me first. Proverbs 17, 4 says, wrongdoers eagerly listen to gossip. Liars pay close attention to slander. So we have to first look at our own heart. Have I done something wrong? And guys, can I just say, I miss the honorable society that would first say, what did, what, have I done something? And searching my own heart, even if the person's irrational, wait a second, maybe there's some truth to what they've said and there's some areas I need to change. Guys, that needs to be our heart in every situation. That first we come and we say, man, I I really slipped up and I I did say more than I should have said. I did listen. And and listen, guys, I want my friends to know that their name is safe on my lips when their backs are turned. And we've all been guilty of saying something too quickly, making a judgment too quickly. And man, and and, and I've learned, but I want people to know, and and I've, I've determined that the people that I'm in covenant with, they need to know how to do proper biblical confrontation. I need to know that they're in my corner when the door shuts and other people are over at their house. And we have to learn biblically that we're not in junior high anymore. And there is a way biblically to resolve conflict. When a person wants justification, they go to everyone else. But when they want reconciliation, they come to you. we got to learn how to go to people and talk to them. I can't tell you how many times, and I'm sure you're the same way, You hear that people are upset with you that have had every opportunity to talk to you directly, but you hear it from everyone else and not the person. And that's not biblical. So we have to first ask ourselves, have I done this? And of course we all have. Of course there's things that we could grow in. So we first search our own hearts, and then we're going to try the process of biblical confrontation. And so after the process of biblical confrontation has been attempted and rejected, and this is a teaching, okay, I'm just going to, it's like Bible school for you guys. Unfortunately, This is not taught and held to enough in the body of Christ. Jesus tells us what to do if your brother offends you. Can I tell you something? If you get around me long enough, I am going to upset you or do something wrong. I am human and very, very frail, and I am trying. I promise. I am on my face asking God to help change me into the image of Jesus. I'm going to fail you. I am. But I am telling you that if we have a heart of reconciliation, there is nothing that we can't work through if we both approach this with love. But we have to talk to one another. That's how things are solved. And so we search our own heart. But can I tell you, I have seen some situations that looked completely impossible to resolve. And when both parties are willing to do this, 
even impossible situations come out with peace, and sometimes they're the closest relationships afterwards when they approach reconciliation biblically. And so this is what Jesus says to do. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault on Facebook. No. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault with an intervention of a room full of people. No. Thank you. If your brother sins, go, him, go to him and show him in fault, his fault and say, we all agree, everyone I've talked to has been uh, talking about this, and we agree that you have this issue. Don't you love when somebody comes to you like that? Well, thank you for having the meeting and not inviting me, right? We need to give people the dignity we would want. Go and show him his fault in private, not in a text. If you can avoid it, not on the phone, face-to-face in private. Go and show him. Please don't come to someone else and talk about someone else until you've gone to that person. Let them. Go to them first. It's biblical. If he listens and pays attention to you, you've won your brother. But if he does not listen, take along with you one or two others. For every word may be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So someone else that can come and talk to that person with you. If he pays no attention to them, refusing to listen and obey, tell it to the church. Now, it doesn't mean come up here and we're going to make today's announcements of those who would not listen to biblical restoration are as follows. Debbie Bolin, Hannah Prince. Jimmy Prince would not listen. We came with two. Now we're bringing it before the church. No, that's not what it's talking about. It's about going to church leadership, bringing a leader in the church to help you. And perhaps this person with the wisdom of God can help them reconcile this area. Still in private to the church. And if he refuses to listen to even the church, let him be as a Gentile or unbeliever and tax collector. Again, says it again. Have nothing else to do with him. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, whatever you bind... Forbid, declare, or be improper and unlawful on earth will already have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose, permit, declare lawful on earth will already have been loosed in heaven. Now, I hear this verse a lot of times talking about prayer, and I believe it's about prayer. You bind on earth. I bind it in Jesus' name. You ever heard that? Okay, I bind it on, on, on heaven. But actually, in context, what this is talking about is whatever you allow in your life. <laughs> if you're allowing this to go on in this person's life, you're allowing it on earth. You're going to continue to have an open door with this person unless you forbid this person have access anymore. Because you're not going to entertain this sin, this willful sin. So here's, here's the balance in all this. First of all, people can't fix what they don't know is broken. If you haven't had a conversation with them, then shame on you if you walk away from that relationship. If you haven't had the courage to go to them in love, then shame on you if you walk away. Because they can't fix what they don't know is broken. Have the courage and decency and honor to love someone enough to wound them slightly so that they could be healed. Scripture says that better are the wounds of a friend than the kisses of an enemy. That an enemy will coddle you right to death, but a friend will say, I'm I'm worried for you and where you're headed right now. Even if it puts the, the friendship in jeopardy. So now when I do this, I prefer gently and in the moment. I prefer anything I can avoid to try to have a sit down, hey, I need to talk to you. Like, I I try to avoid that, okay? I I prefer in the moment, if someone comes to me and they're saying something they should not be saying to me, I'm like, hey, have you talked to them about that? I really feel like you should be talking to them about that, not me. Like, it's not fair to them if you're talking to me and you haven't even, like, explained to them that they hurt you. So do you see what I'm talking about? It doesn't have to be this formality. You can just, in in the moment, you're you're saying, this is not okay. Like, I want you to, to talk to them about this. So I prefer gently in the moment, if possible, or as they start talking about some, a relationship there and immorality, I'm really worried for you. Like, I, I feel like that's not, you know, do you understand the end of that is death? The end of that is pain, that you're going to end up brokenhearted. Gently in the moment is easier than sitting down and having an intervention, right? So this, again, is private and face-to-face. And so the third thing is after every effort has been made to biblically restore this person. So you've, you've prayed about your own heart. You've tried biblical confrontation the way the scripture tells you to. And then you've made every effort that you can. In Ephesians 4, 2, it says this, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Listen, this should not be a knee-jerk decision. It should not thrill you to cut a person off. It should, it should burden you. You should be burdened when the Lord came to Samuel and told Samuel enough is enough with Saul. Stop crying over him. Samuel was on his face weeping because God's spirit had left Saul. He didn't want him to be cut off. 
And that should be how we approach it, that we're burdened. We're not happy. We don't go back and talk about them and tell other people they didn't listen. Their name should be on the list that we read out loud in the church, right? We should be burdened by this. And so the last thing we'll cover, and I'm going to close, and keys can come up, is how does the Bible command us to separate from someone? So we talked about when, because timing is important. But let's talk about how, just practically. First, you're going to gently and honestly draw clear boundaries. Gently and honestly. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you. Be separate. This word separate in the Greek means to mark off from others by boundaries, to limit, to separate. In 2 Timothy 2, 23 through 25, again I say, don't get involved in foolish and ignorant arguments that only start fights. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel. If someone is quarreling and divisive, they shouldn't be in leadership. Because a servant of the Lord, and I don't think it's just about leadership. This is about if you call yourself a servant of Jesus Christ, you shouldn't enjoy arguing. Enjoy dividing. Enjoy shouldn't be a part of your nature. The nature of Christ is gentle and meek and lowly and humble. He must not quarrel, but be kind to everyone. Be able to teach. Be patient with difficult people. Gently instruct those who approach, uh, oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's heart and they will learn the truth. Gently. That mark off boundaries, the Greek says, you do this with conversation when they come to you. Oh, I, I just feel like really uncomfortable with talking about this. I just don't feel like it's right for us to talk about. I, don't, I wouldn't want to hurt her. Like if she overheard this, like this would wound her. I think you need to talk to her. Do you see where I'm gently, humbly, I'm not saying, girl, you gossiping. God's going to smote you up. The ground's going to swallow you. Like it's, it's gently in the moment, right? Like have you talked to them? Or I'm so worried. I'm like just worried that this guy is not good for you and that you're making compromises. Like when, you, when you posted that, like it looks like you're putting yourself out there for someone to like, just remember, you, you know, people look to you as a leader. That's what I'm talking about. Gently, humbly approaching the conversation, not judgmentally. Have the honest conversation. And you know what's going to happen? If the person is belligerent and doesn't want to change, organically, they're going to separate from you. A person who just loves to gossip and slander, they don't like being my friend very long. Because I'm not, I'm not going to have fun and we're not going to drink and, and talk about all the people that you want to talk about. I just don't allow it. I redirect the conversation so often. The boundary, the wall goes up, you get the point. And then if they're insistent on doing that, they go to someone else who wants that. Because I'm not, they've realized it's not what I want to be a part of. I didn't have to have this full out weird conversation. Not that those aren't necessary time, at times. But just with the boundaries I'm putting up with, with this, there's a natural separation. Or if there's immorality, just a natural separation. They want to talk about all the crazy wild party and they're doing. And I, it's not comfortable for me. So naturally, they stop calling. The texts get further and further in between. The calls get further and further in between. There's a natural separation that happens there. Do you, do you hear what I'm saying? This is not how the church has done this. And it's caused, it's caused wounding. And I love that it's saying perhaps they'll hear the truth. That's the goal in all of this. Perhaps they'll hear the truth. You said that in 1 John, it said Jesus was the word made flesh and dwelt among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son. Listen to this. He's full of grace and truth. We too often swing to one or the other. Just grace? And we give them a false sense of security? If their hand is on a stove and it's wounding their marriage, their children, their life, their relationship with God, a destructive path, dismantling the church, and we don't love them enough to speak the truth? We don't love them. We're more worried about our friendship and how this affects us than we are that person. We have to have truth, but guys, we also have to have a lot of grace. We can't swing to both. It's, it's not either or, it's both and grace and truth. That when I share the truth, I'm doing it knowing that except by the grace of God, there go I, that I've probably done the same thing that you've already done that I've made the same mistakes and so I'm not going to come to you with pointing the finger because really I share the same fallen condition of humanity. It's grace and truth. So we keep our own heart, the last thing is we keep our own heart uh, posture humble. Galatians 6, 1, dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently, humbly help that person right on, back on the right path. But be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. There seems to be some indication in Scripture through study that when we go to restore someone, we become susceptible to the sin that we're trying to restore them from. 
So this shows me when I'm approaching someone, and I've learned this through the pattern of history, the way that I'm tempted when I'm dealing in counseling, when I'm going to someone to restore them, that I have to also watch for that open door. That week, that two weeks later, that month later, I need to watch. If I'm restoring someone that's come out of sin, I'm probably going to be tempted in the same area. That I, Why? Because we're dealing with principalities and rulers of darkness. And so we have to understand that we gently and humbly, knowing that we could fall in the same area to guard against judgmentalism. I warn them, if we start to separate, Here's the biggest thing I want you to take away from this. If you're considering separating from someone, other than being honest with them and examining your own heart, listen to me. After you've done this, your biggest responsibility is your own heart. You pray for them, but you don't conjure in your brain of how you're better than them. You don't tell their weakness. You leave them their dignity. You leave them their dignity. It says, pay careful attention to your own work in Galatians 6. For then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done. You won't need to compare yourself with anyone else, for we are each responsible for our own conduct. I've done my part now and what the Bible has told me to do, and now I'm going to go back to really watching my own heart and not pointing the finger at this person that is right now suffering and going through something. The final thing is this. We are approaching this with the mindset of future restoration. We are never separating ourselves and cutting someone off for life. That is never the intention. That is never the intention. The intention is to allow a natural separation so that they know that, listen, I've drawn clear boundaries. There's, here's the truth. And I'm going to hold fast to the truth. And I love him too much. I can't unhitch. I love you so much. And I love you too much to unhitch from him. But listen, you're always welcome back. Anytime. You're welcome to come back. Anytime. Anytime. In 2 Corinthians, I love this. This this is Paul. When he's, remember the guy, he said, throw this man out of the church so that his soul be delivered to Satan. Okay. He says it's so, so harsh. I'm like, gosh, Paul, you know, but it actually says, throw him out. So for the destruction of his flesh, so that his soul might be spared. The whole point in this is the soul might be spared. Why? The end of sin is pain and death. The end of sin is pain and death. You're trying to save the one you love from a path you know is going to hurt them. From a path you know is hurting those around them, that is consuming them. So the end is restoration. You want restoration. So what you do, that's why you leave them with dignity. And you don't talk about other people. And you still are kind to them when you see them. Because one day, you're going to be like the prodigal son's father that watches by the window for when they're ready to come back home. That you're not writing them off, do not enter, come back with a gavel, I told you so, no. Your heart posture needs to be like the posture heart of God that's waiting by the window for them to run. Come on, come on, I'm going to run to you. Oh, it's, it's fine. We always, you always have a place to come back home. We all sin. We all fall short. It's fine when they're ready that you're waiting for them. Second Corinthians 2, this is the same guy he's talking about. Paul says, I'm not, this is the second letter he wrote, this is years later. I'm not overstating it when I say the man who caused all this trouble and hurt all of you more than he hurt, hurt all of you more than he hurt me. Most of you opposed him and that was punishment enough. Now, however, it's time to forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, he may be overcome by discouragement. I urge you now to reaffirm your love for someone. So some of you in here, maybe you've felt the whole, you've seen these scriptures, you've applied them wrong, you've cut some people off harshly and the word of the Lord for you is go back and reaffirm your love for them. Go back and tell them if you did this wrong and if you misrepresented God. Go back and reaffirm your love for them. Do you hear the the, the love permeates this whole message? Love permeates this. Can we bow our, our heads today? I just want you to ask God, God, what are you speaking to me? God, what are you speaking to me? In your home right now, just grab the hand of the person next to you. Come on to your home. I know it's I know it's strange, but listen. Meeting in your homes right now is the most natural expression of Christianity there is. To pray with one another. You have to be intentional. It's not just watching TV. Grab the the hand of the person that's in the room with you right now. Begin to ask the Lord to forgive you for areas where you've fallen short. And what's so beautiful is he shows us through his word not to condemn us, but to help us get back on the path of life. So, Father, right now, we all acknowledge that we've erred in this. We've spoken too soon, and it's caused pain to those we love. 
we've made judgments too quickly. God, we don't want to be in opposition against your kingdom. We don't want to stoke the flame of what the enemy is trying to do to our nation, to our families, to our church. God, we want to be permeated with love in all that we do. We want to, we want to be like you. So God, right now, we just ask you to forgive us for wounding those around us that we love. And God, I pray that supernaturally, you just begin to speak to everyone under the sound of my voice that you would tell them specific instructions that they would obey specifically if it's going back to a person and confessing. It's going back to a person and reconciling. If it's apologizing. Father, I pray you would teach us to trust your word enough to do it God's way. That biblical reconciliation works. Biblical confrontation works. And I pray we'd have the courage not to do what we've seen society do. But Lord, to cling to the word of God and to trust it, that it works and that we can build our homes, our lives, our church, and our nation upon it. And we thank you. I pray you bless your people and you keep them. Your face would shine upon them. In Jesus' name.